Oh, there I am. Hello. Yeah. All right. Yo, yo, yo. Welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about shaders, game development, and developing games in shaders. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about myself. Uh, uh, I am Fuopi, and uh, I got my start making games back in middle school. I started off with RPG Maker 2000, 2003, top-notch software. Then I got into Visual Basic once uh, 2008 came around. It was a lot of fun because uh, Visual Basic 2008 was free, and uh, yeah, it opened up a lot of doors. And then after that, did some NES development, got into homebrew, and fast forward now into 2021, I'm bringing Artiboy, one of my favorite game systems ever, into VRChat. Now, a little bit of a heads up. Uh, to enjoy this talk, you might want to know just a little bit about programming. If you can cite, read, if, then, else statements, you're good. But uh, And understanding the basics of a game loop is a plus. But other than that, you should be fine. Now, uh, the backstory. Basically, a couple months ago, I, was, uh, I wanted to take a vacation. And going into my vacation, I had a very simple plan. I wanted to share the love of Artiboy with everybody in VRChat. The reason I love Artiboy is simple. Its uh, open source community is very strong. The games are all mostly MIT licensed, and the hardware is open source too. In fact, right now there's a competition going on to where you can, if you build an Artiboy based on the open source schematic, if it's good, they'll just send you a free Artiboy. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it's quite an awesome community. So uh, yeah, the concept of the product that I wanted to share with everybody was a game store where people could walk in and play Artie Boy games made by the community over the years. The Artie Boy came out in, uh, so now, now here's the Artie Boy itself. The Artie Boy is a modern 8-bit game system. It came out in around 2015 or so, and it's uh, based on the Arduino, Arduino Leonardo, basically. So it's got a 16 megahertz at Mega 32U4, it's got 32K of ROM, about 28K of which is usable for your games. The rest is bootloader. Then you've got uh, 2.5K of RAM and uh, 1K of save data. And to top it all off, you've got a glorious 128 by pix 128 by 64 monochrome OLED display, and it just looks gorgeous. Your games will cut through the darkness of the night with, with this display. All you, you have to see it for yourself to, to really understand the beauty of it. Now, in this little screenshot I have here, this is uh, an early developer unit. When I I was first developing my game Glove. I actually had early access to the Artie Boy. Before it launched on the website, it launched on an indie hardware website called Tindy. And um, so, yeah, basically, I have long ties with Artie Boy at this point. <laughs> I love that system. But anyway, yeah. Now, uh, yeah, so let's go over what I tried. My goal was, once again, to bring Artie Boy to VRChat. First off, I started with Udon. Now, I... Uh, I looked into writing the logic in Udon. You can do all the logic just fine. But I got stopped pretty early on because I found out that there's no way to do a sort of graphics.blit operation. Uh, if you're not familiar, Udon's like a super neat VM that runs in uh, VRChat. That's how the new games are. Uh, that's the new runtime for games. And uh, different APIs are exposed to it. But uh, there's no graphics.blit exposed, unfortunately. So I moved on to the next thing which was to do a hybrid Udon and shader sort of solution. So I made a DVD logo bouncing sort of shader. And uh, if you can see it, which and unfortunately looks like the animated GIF isn't animating. So I'll try using the laser pointer to simulate it. It did, it stopped. It, it animated. Oh, it stopped? Yeah. Okay, well then here, I'll do it, I'll do it manually. Like... <laughs> oh, okay, for sure. <laughs> well, no, no, can you see it? Can, does, does it show up on the stream? Yeah, so imagine a DVD logo bouncing. The, the bouncing is driven by Udon. I did all the logic for the physics in Udon, and the shader simply uh, displays a sprite at the given XY position. Um, that's it. And it was, honestly, it worked pretty well, but I thought that maintaining both a C sharp side of the code and a C plus or a HLSL side of the code was going to get a little bit complicated. So I looked for another alternative, and I settled on writing the entire game in a shader. And so now I'm going to talk about my complete shader approach to making games. Um, but first, let's let's talk about a little bit of the differences between writing a game in a shader versus writing a game in like a traditional game environment. So if anyone's familiar with writing games normally, 
you have a you have like a frame buffer that you can write to and you have nice apis like draw rectangle or draw sprite something like that and so basically as your game rendering code is running you're building up the this nice little picture, you know, drawing a rectangle here, drawing your character, doing all these things. And once it looks nice and pretty, then you can present it to the gamer and they're going to have a good time. But we don't get this in the shader code. So, so uh, yeah, how did I um, how did I manage to do it? Well, in a shader, uh, um, you actually only get a very small amount of information that you have to work with in order to produce a pixel display. Uh, in a shader, you're given an X and Y position of the pixel that you are requested to draw. And so it's like the opposite problem, right? The problem is turned on its head. Um, and so it's kind of complicated. And I ended up doing what I usually do when something is complicated. I write a story about it with characters and I personify it. So this next slide is going to be me reading the story that I wrote. And uh, it takes place in the kingdom of Pong. So, <laughs> it's a familiar tennis style game. So, in the land of Pong, four agreeable nobles guide a doubly agreeable population. The southwest noble, Uno, organizes day and night. The population, as well as the other nobles, look to Uno to know whether to sleep or to work. The northeast noble, Dos, is in charge of recreation. The kingdom looks to Dos to know where the puck is. In the event of a lost puck, Dos will help restore order. The southwest noble, Trey, leads the western Pong team. The citizens look to Trey to know where the team's vessel lies. Trey prevents disorderly conduct by keeping the vessel within the walls of the kingdom. Likewise, the southeast noble, Quattro, leads the eastern Pong team. Now, the population looks to each of the four nobles. Using their common sense and wit, each member does their best to construct what they believe that the vision the four nobles hope is to be. And with that, we are going to look at the implementation. So here is the finished tennis implementation. You have the red paddle on the right, the blue paddle on the left. So there's the nobles, right? There's the noble of night and day. Uh, it's red. That means they're going to work and, uh, and not sleep. And then you have on the top right, the noble of the red team. It's magenta. That means the red paddles around the middle. And then you have the, yeah. yeah. So, and then you have the balls noble on the bottom right you can see it's changing color so the blue color represents the ball's angle the red color represents the ball's x volt position and the green color represents the ball's y position and then on the screen as i'm drawing pixels on the shader i have i'm given the x and y right shaders you only know an x and y position right going in and you have to produce a color going out so Given an arbitrary X and Y position, I sample the color at each of the four things, and I do a bunch of if, if statements, and that's how I decide what the correct color is, basically. That's sort of what the story was describing. So with that, we've got to take a look at what is the result. So if, if you didn't realize it by now, we're doing a lot of redundant work. Every single pixel is doing the exact same calculations, but it doesn't matter. I, uh, doesn't seem to matter. So I asked my friend, it works on their computer, works on my machine, um, works on AMD, NVIDIA, it worked on Quest 2. So, uh, at least anecdotally, it seems to work. And, um, I haven't, I haven't had any problems in testing. And, um, so that's just the reality of it. <laughs> and, uh, working with limited knowledge was another problem. Uh, the pixels are super large. Once again, let's go back and take another look. Those pixels right there are super large, partly because I did not know very much about shaders when I was writing this. So I there's a thing called sampler 2D that is the default um, parameter when you make a surface shader. I just didn't know anything better, so I just used the default sampler 2D, and I kind of sampled somewhere in the middle of those pixels just because I didn't know how to use texture 2D at the time. And uh, I mean, it ended up working, <laughs> but anyway, um, it was a lot of fun learning very quickly. So I was, I was pretty happy with what I got at with three days of work going from no shader knowledge to creating Pong. So yeah, um, next is Glove. So with Pong out of the way, I wanted to move something to something a little bit more complex, which uh, is Glove. Glove was my first Ardy Boy game. I wrote it back in 2015 for the dev unit, like I showed earlier. and. Um, yeah, uh, here's the trailer for Glove that it... Let's see. Okay. 
And uh, do I need to hit uh, play video by any chance, or is it auto playing? No, no, oh, never mind. It is. It's been nice. And that's Glove, yeah. So Glove is, the original concept was basically, when I wanted to learn how to make RD Boy games, I started with one of my favorite games, Gauntlet. And I kind of reduced it, made it smaller, cozier, and now we have Glove. And so, with, without further ado, let's talk about how it was made. I split the Pong shader into two different shaders, the Logic shader and the Render shader. So first, let's take a look at the Logic shader, yes. The logic shader. The logic shader processes the game logic. At the beginning of the shader, we have the preamble. The preamble is looking at our custom render texture here. So here, why don't I talk about this first? This right here is, a, is our custom render texture. Each of these pixels um, that's red represents a number between 0 and 255. This white pixel here is an example of a negative number. I use all four bytes to provide an easy way of mapping between an int32 or a float32 um, straight to a color, and I just use as in to, uh, to parse it back. It's a pretty straightforward. Now, each row represents an array, except for this bottom row right here. This bottom row is all single variables. But other than that, you can see we have a game loop going where things are being iterated, all sorts of crazy accesses are happening. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, now. Uh, the preamble is when we uh, read each of these pixels, which are well known and defined ahead of time. We know exactly what pixel uh, refers to what meaningful value in memory, right? And we put them into global variables. And so this bottom left one right here, that's the player's X position. So in the preamble, I would read that pixel into a global variable called player.x, for example. And that's all there is to it, yeah. And then after that, we do our game logic. We do it exactly like normal. Uh, in this code, it will be pretty much indistinguishable from normal C++. And then at the very end, we uh, save our values in the reverse way and in the shader way. So in a shader, remember, we're only given an X and Y value, and we're expected to produce a color for that X and Y value. So um, basically, we have to know which of the global variables is meaningful um, given what we're destined to write to. And and that's what the save step does. Now let's take a look at a little bit of the code. So the preamble code, um, we have a pretty standard beginning of the shader. We have our our properties. I bind the joystick right here. Uh, the joystick code is actually done in Udon. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's one of the few pieces that's done in Udon is the joystick. After that, it's all pretty standard boilerplate um, HLSL stuff right there. We we have a reference to the canvas so that we can read and write from it. And um, then we have our uh, joystick. And finally, we load the state. Yeah, and so let's take a look at what it means to load the state. Now, this is the function that uh, reads from the texture. I wrote a little helper thing called unpack int. Given uh, a sample, a color, it just reads the color values into an int32 or a float32 or whatever, and into all of our global variables that I talked about earlier. And uh, we do this for every single thing, even arrays of structures, we do this exact same procedure. Now, uh, the game loop. This is the fun part, and this is the part I like the best. Because if you look at this code, it looks just like standard C++ code. In fact, 
when I made this game, I literally copied Arduboy C++ files from the original GitHub repo and renamed it .hlsl. And and just deleted stuff until the red underlines went away. <laughs> and um, yeah, so you'll see at the top, there's in out bad guy OBJ, right? It used to be in out bad guy. It used to be bad guy ampersand OBJ, right? Um, not much to change there. And then here, int, 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 it used to be smaller types like chars or um, shorts and things like that. But other than changing everything to 32-bit values um, and changing some of the syntax, it ended up working pretty much like identically. Uh, the next step is, there we go, more of the game loop. So uh, right here, we have our game state switcher. If you're um, if you're familiar with game programming, you know, you have game states, right? There's the title screen logic. There's our logic when we display the level name. There's our game logic we execute when we do the game loop. Um, one important thing to note about porting Boy games is, as cool and open source as all of them are, they're all MIT licensed for the most part. Uh, they're kind of, um, there's some bad code in them, and uh, my game was no exception. I, I had delay 1000s here and there, and uh, what I had to do was unroll them into state machines, just to, because uh, you can't delay in a shader. Um, <laughs> it's not going to work. You have to, uh, yeah, you have to unroll it into a state machine. If you write like a for loop that lasts forever in a shader, it'll, it'll crash. You don't want to do that. So next, we will go and take a look at saving state. After all the update logic has been processed, we just do our little save state function. Once again, our only input was an X and Y value, and we our only output is a color. So what does save state do? Let's take a look. Oh yeah, and one more note. Yes, at the end, we write a single value, all that work for one pixel, yes. Uh, that's significant because I'm gonna, yeah, here, I wanna show you something really amazing. Here, let's go back a couple slides. There we go. This is a 256 by 256 pixel texture, right? For every single pixel, we're running the exact game logic code, meaning we run the game logic in its entirety 65,536 times. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, um, but once again, well, you'll you'll see you'll see you'll see coming forward what what that means. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's saving state. There's our there's our implementation of saving the state. We have I implemented it as a switch statement. We have our single variables rows, our sound effects rows. Well, I'll I'll get into sound effects in a little bit. And then the bad guy positions. Now I uh, even though they're structs, they're implemented as structs. I found it much easier just to uh, put every single member of every struct on its own row. Which is, which is just easier. Um, but you can do it however you like really um and then uh i in this version of the game i made a specialized function just because i wasn't really sure if i would need one or not and i made this whole thing in a week and i figured well i already have momentum let's just go for it my my I'm, my second game i'm porting doesn't do it this way uh but uh there it is there's a specialized function. So there's a lot of redundancy and it's but it's not that hard to deal with and finally, um, let's take a look. Yeah, so redundant work. We do it 65,536 times, but in practice, I'm using a 1660 Ti, and uh, my world performs really, really well. Um, and everyone else that I've had test has it run really, really well. And uh, I looked up some of the specs on Shader Model 5 and all the GPUs that came out like recently should be fine in terms of like how many branches they support. I as far as I can tell. And uh, yeah, um, I think I succeeded here in easy to port games because basically we're not doing anything shader like at all. <laughs> we're doing a completely standard style now. We just, we're like shaders, no thanks. No, we're just gonna do it our way. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty happy about that. Um, now in the next slide, we're gonna talk about the rendering shader. This is the fun part because you actually get to see the game being played right now. Um, like the logic shader, we draw the game. Well, no. Like the logic shader, we have a preamble at the beginning. Um, we read all the texture pixels into variables, into our globals. Now, I have this word state independent here to refer to, uh, it's kind of a weird word, but basically by that, I mean um, all the truth for what to render is stored in the logic shader, not in the render shader. This shader does not maintain any in internal variables or internal state whatsoever. Uh, uh, all the truth in the logic shader is read directly by this. 
Meaning you might want to put terminal conditions on your for loops and things like that. Even if you don't think you need them, you don't know what kind of garbage might be passed. I don't know. Um, stuff like that. And also, so, um, yeah, uh, we don't have a frame buffer to write to, which is kind of significant because most of the time when you're writing a game, you're able to write to a frame buffer, but this is writing hot off the, the, the logic variables. And uh, I'm going to go through my process in the next slide of how that works. Um, yep. Actually, no, no, let's do it right here. Yeah, so basically the draw logic executes until a white pixel is drawn. So the Artie Boy, like I said earlier, it's a monochrome display. It's uh, black and white. There's no grays, there's no colors, nothing. And if you think of black being the default color and white being the something happened color, uh, you can take it to mean that um, when a pixel, a white pixel is, pixel is drawn, the work is done and you can just return. So my whole game is uh, built around early returns, and you'll see how that looks in the, in one of the later slides. So once again, our we have our same boilerplate sort of beginning uh, code um, or whatever. Oh, I think I lost the pen. But anyway, at the top of the si slide, you can see we have the same code. Uh, I have some additional bindings here. So I have the logic canvas like before, so we can read the memory values of the game. But I also introduced some new uh, things. We're the renderer, so we need a sprite sheet to render. We need a font to render. I render the title screen as its own special image here. And I use black as the default background color. So there it is. There's the color that you see when no work happens. And then there's all the same declarations. And at the bottom, load state. So now we're up to par with what we talked about with the logic, sh logic sh Later. Um, and now it's time to go into what happens in a specific part of the game loop. So I have this macro defined right here called pixel. All it does is it's just a wrapped early return. If title draw, for example, returns white, pixel just, oh, is it white? If so, return white. It, it just, it's so, it's easy to just early return all the way down all the way from like draw character to draw string to draw whatever down to the end yep um so moving on we've got our uh oh yes we've got our render logic this is something i'm also happy about so once again it looks pretty similar to just standard c plus plus code uh you know if you didn't see things like float 4 you might mistake it for c plus plus code it's um there's not too much um special going on you'll see i have a, a library like function draw integer right there draw string draw filled rectangle literally the primitives that i talked about earlier that are missing when you're working in shaders there they are um um so and there's the pixel wrapper doing the early return thing that i talked about earlier and uh but yeah pretty much that's it that was the that was the render shader and um so now I guess um, it's time to talk about some of the challenges that I had while working on this project. And uh, documentation was a big one. So the documents do exist. Unity docs have a lot of helpful information, but going in I had no real understanding of like how to find, I don't know, shaders were just so mystical. I, I knew nothing about them. Thankfully, I had my friends, um, I had my friend Leia get me started with some example boilerplate code and people in Merlin Shaders Discord helped me um, set up all the right little values to plug into the Unity editor. So it was, I ended up getting like all the things that I needed um, thanks to the help of the community. But one thing I wish is that information was more readily available. Um, and so going forward, uh, at least for my project, I'm going to encourage people to use forums more often because I think Discord is, you know, we're at risk right now of experiencing another GeoCity situation. Like, what's like all the punk rock bands and stuff are going to get lost in Discord. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so uh, hopefully, um, I don't know. I hope to encourage people to use publicly searchable stuff uh, going forward, at least for this project. Um, and yeah, once again, limited knowledge. I already talked about that with the tennis game. I used those big pixels to get around that situation. But yeah. And uh, basically, here's one of the more interesting quirks that I still don't quite fully understand, but I'm showing it because it's interesting. Uh, what I think is happening here, this is something I ran into when I was porting the UI system from Glove. 
At the bottom, you see my ideal code that I wanted to write. I have this assignment and a bunch of subscripts and a bunch of like objects. It's just, it looks like a simple assignment, but the, the compiler was giving me this error. And how I interpreted it is the, basically maybe the bytecode just had no way of uh, representing that addressing mode that needed to be used for such an assignment. That addressing mode just doesn't exist in the bytecode for. So I wrote this weird, uh, loop this for loop to pad the assignment uh, and it ended up working <laughs> but it's like a yeah it's just a funny thing that you might have to do honestly I feel like the compiler should have been able to generate code like this and maybe give a warning or something but who knows I if you have any if anyone has any input I'd love to hear it and uh, yeah, going forward, this is um, this is the exciting stuff. So I'm going to continue porting Ardiboy games. I'm almost done with my second. I'm going to release it pretty soon. And uh, then I have eight more after that. The Ardiboy has got a lot of decent MIT licensed games. And um, yeah, they're, they're just wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I want people to learn how to write games and shaders. I'm a fan of Ardu boy but there's no reason you can't take my code um it's my code's actually on github already you can use it you can use it right now um and make your own game with it and um it's mit license so have fun but yeah i want people to learn how to write shader games so we can have more games in vr chat uh a limitation that really does that it's limiting is uh i don't have networking support yet for this game shader so so uh, my original dream was to recreate what I experienced when I was in college. Basically, I'd get home from class, you know, I'd uh, turn on Mega Man 2, put a cassette in the boom box, and my brother might join me, and we'd take turns, like, playing levels. It was, it was a great time. I, I want to recreate that feeling in social VR. And, uh, yeah, I haven't gotten to that point. And the really, the one blocking issue for me is um, uh, I'm getting bad performance when I um, sample using a camera from the custom render texture and so if anyone knows how to improve performance there i'm all ears <laughs> but um i actually have a working prototype uh with terrible performance of a uh, pre pre uanu um code synchronized over the network i have a third shader where i do all the buffering in this third shader called the input shader which controls the the frame rate of the second shader which then dr which then um which is the logic shader and then i have the render shader it's it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in the meantime, though, even though we don't have networking, we can still have fun and have a semi-social gaming experience, uh, like high score share. So Glove has a high score list. When you join a world, you play a little bit and your game gets saved as a high score it, uh, for that session. And uh, basically, yeah, I'm probably going to throw them up on the wall in that world and they'll merge and people will be able to compare. So that's, that's something. That's like a little idea. Um, but aside from any of the multiplayer aspects, there's fun things that you can only really do in social VR. Uh, I want to add audio reactivity to my glove game or something like that, just to the rendering engine in general, so that people can play like a YouTube video or something and have like glove go nuts with your really hardcore music, um, you know, cool special effects and colors changing all over the screen. And that would that's totally possible. That would be so much fun. And so I'd like to see that kind of stuff done. And um, one thing, though, that I feel like I did manage to accomplish with this project was uh, I was able to have the feeling of uh, sharing something that I created uh, and, yeah, sharing a game I created and have people play it. And I get to, you know, see and play it. And uh, it's a really nice feeling, and I'm hoping that... Uh, uh, by sharing with this project with other people, more will be encouraged to try making their own games and maybe have the same feeling as I did, because <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, um, with that, does anyone have any questions? Mm. Mm. That was all the job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. I guess uh, the four questions. Patrick Wilson was in the YouTube chat, I mean, I mean, and they were like, "Hey, I made music for this trailer and like stuff like that." And, oh yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> Heck yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You. Yep. Thank you so much. Also, the music for the world too. By the way, if you go to the official world, that's all original tracks by him. So uh, yeah, shout out to Patrick. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Mm. The question circles over there, but yeah. very stabby. Oh, where? Mm. Where's Rubik's? It's over there. It's over here. Mm -hmm. it's over at uh, Rubik. There we go. 
Oh, hey. Okay. Um, yeah, question. How do you compensate for varying frame rates of different devices? Do you take that into account? That's an absolutely wonderful question. While I was practicing presenting earlier today, um, somebody told me that there was a thing called Delta Time and Shaders, so I'm going to start learning how to use that. <laughs> so I'll get right back to you on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, nice. I was originally thinking about doing something like a render zone because I learned about that two weeks ago. I'm just really implementing stuff as I go. Um, it's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Another question. You've shown that you have yeah. something specific with the Audi Boy. I was wondering if you were planning on eventually moving on to another platform or if you were to, in the future, continue specifically to aim at that. So uh, that's a good question, too. So I do want to commit to porting 10 Audi Boy games, but that's my plan I probably for like the next six months. After that, I'm open to other ideas. Um, but in the meantime, I'm really focused on Ardu Boy. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We got another question. Um, mm -hmm. The um, current stuff is all based on flat surfaces, right? But have you considered anything about uh, using like a vertex shader to uh, render things in 3D mm -hmm. for your game? Like you're basically making a shader that creates a 3D object in space. Honestly, that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, I've, I haven't written a vertex shader before. I definitely want to learn. Um, uh, I did have like uh, fun ideas where it's like you could cross uh, the game and some of the VR chat like worlds. Like I wanted to have like a thing where like you looked at the moon. If you looked at it for like ten seconds, like the whole like moon would encase your screen and or something like that. I think there's like a lot of opportunity for like cross three D, cross two D experiences. Um, but I would also love to do something like Voxatron, uh, like because that what you described kind of reminds me of Voxatron, and yeah, that would be super cool. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. What are your plans for future projects in terms of like other games with this kind of like knowledge you got here? Because there's some good so, potential with this. I, it, I've i actually been working on an original Artie Boy game. I, I put it on pause uh, three years ago, but I'm, I'm starting to go back to it. I didn't mention this in the game store thing, but when I make the game store level, I want to um, sort of promote it, my magnum opus, if you will, Ardu Boy game when that comes out. So that's my 11th game that I, yeah, that's, that's going to be my big original title um, along all these ports that I'll be doing. Um, so that's, that's my plan. Yeah. Mm. And it's going to be cross-platform both on Ardu Boy and VR Chat. Yeah. Ooh, I have mm -hmm. another one as well. Uh, yeah. Do you plan on making these kinds of games distributable? And like, would you be able to make like a prefab of these so people could put these games in their own worlds? Oh yes, definitely. Um, if you go on my GitHub right now, I have a prefab. It's a it's version zero point zero three or something really early. Uh, you can grab the prefab right now and put it in your world. It's actually that prefab's already in Club Emission. If um, if you want to visit that world, uh, it it includes mm. an example way to do the licensing. I'm gonna simplify it so it looks nicer later. I'll probably bake the licensing into the logic so nobody has to have any weird planes floating around. But um, it's just MIT. Though, so it's like there's really not much to mess up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. But definitely. Mm -hmm. That it? Okay. It looks like it, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, thanks for sh coming, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks thanks for your amazing talk. Awesome. Let's go. YouTube also liked it a lot. Yeah. So did this, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I guess uh, I hit yeah, stop now, I guess. Um, yes. Yeah. You do.